In this week's update, highly likely the US index lows are in. Aussie miners unquestionably the place to be, but there are numerous other highly attractive non-mining stocks in Australia. My name is Gary Davis. As always, this is general advice, and please remember to like and subscribe to the video. Let's start with a normal market perspective, and it's been uh, another roller coaster week. Um, the US signals have certainly improved. Uh, if you recall back to last week, I said that it looked as though the bottom could be in, but I was very wary that it was just a manufactured bounce because of options expiry, and that I wanted another couple of days to see what happened uh, once we got out of the impact of, uh, of options expiry. Well, that happened and we didn't get weakness um, either on the, the Monday or the Tuesday, um, and the strength really continued through the week. So that was the positive that came out of it. But the signals are, are a bit mixed, as you'll, as you'll see. So overall positive, you'd have to be reasonably confident to say the lows are in, uh, but could we go down again towards towards those lows? Could we just go sideways at the index level? You know, all those outcomes are possible. Now, the ratio spread charts are definitely looking better, um, but there are some signals that, that just really not terribly consistent with that. And one of the main things is that the breadth of the US market is just a bit too narrow for comfort for me. Uh, we're not seeing a really broad-based rebound like you'd normally see off a, uh, a correction low, um, certainly like what we saw coming out of the COVID crash in, in March of 2020. Um, now, this market hasn't gone down nearly as far, so it was never going to rebound with the same degree of vigor that it did in, um, in 2020. But um, nevertheless, the, the breadth is, is just a little bit too centered in, um, in some large cap stocks for my liking. There is also a very large divergence between industry groups creating, and that creates great opportunities. So that's, that's the good news. If you're trading broadly across the market, you, you might find the going a little bit hard, but if you get focused on the, on the sectors and the industry groups that really continue to do well, then, um, then yeah, you, you can have a pretty good time of it. This is a slide that I put up last week and I thought it was still just very appropriate. So this is just a repeat of last week's slide um, as a, a reminder. So if you did cash up during the correction, then we're still in the rebuilding phase. And it's important to have absolute clarity around what your targets are. You don't want to just go wading in and buying absolutely anything because there is this massive divergence not only in the American market, but in the Australian market as well, between um, between different industry groups. You need to have a bit of a sense of the likely good entry zones. Um, you know, look for the obvious levels of support and see what the price level does around that, that area. Um, taking partial positions um, in the market is, I think, is still a good thing to do. The market is still certainly... Um, has a, a fair degree of uncertainty around it. Um, the Ukraine war, I'm not sure, is having too much impact because everything has really gone up um, quite significantly since um, since that started four weeks ago. But nevertheless, I think there's a case for some uh, some caution. And so taking some partial positions and looking to rebuild progressively rather than in one big hit is um, is probably a pretty good idea. Uh, we took some partial positions. They were uh, some of them took a uh, many days or even many weeks to get triggered. We set low prices, but they did get triggered and uh, and they've rebounded quite nicely. And and some have been setting new highs. So what comes next? Um, I still don't see a need to change my positioning on this, and that's we need to accommodate a possible another leg down in America. I don't think it will be to new lows. But we certainly could partially retrace some of the gains of the last uh, two weeks. And if that happens, if the market does uh, sell down again, then it just sets up even more compelling entries. So American stocks were up um, <clears throat> just under 2% for the week. Um, as I said at the start, the index lows um, pretty likely now to be in place. It's all about 
the weight of evidence and, and probabilities. There's no absolutes, there's no guarantees, but that's certainly what we're looking at. And it does remain a, a fairly narrow market. Um, money flows are really everything. It's not what Wall Street says they're going to do. It's, it's what they're actually doing with the cash. And those money flows are still just a little bit uncertain. The US dollar was higher, 98.81%. Um, the 10-year yield is really shooting higher now, and we're up almost to 2.5%, so that's gone a long way very quickly. The VIX has come back from the low 30s, where it spent several weeks, and we're now back down to the sort of level that we've spent um, most of the last 6 to 12 months at, somewhere around about the 20 mark. So that tells you that there's been certainly been a, um, uh, an easing in the fear factor. The one thing that didn't happen here is that some of the excesses in the market didn't ever get washed out, particularly in the options market. Still too bullish, and that's why I'm still just a little bit on the cautious side because we didn't actually get the the full multiple contraction that would normally come with a correction. We didn't get the change in in sentiment, the bullishness that's in the um, in the options market. Um, and, you know, maybe this time it's not going to happen, but um, just makes me a little bit cautious. We've also got the 10-year, two-year spread. is um, hasn't changed much in the last week. Um, it's just above inversion, which is not a good thing for stocks, but it hasn't gone there yet. All right, so let's look at some charts now. So we'll start with the S&P just for the big picture record, and you can see that we, we broke support on two occasions, but managed to rally back quite strongly. And it really has been uh, quite a strong rebound. And we're now back above the 200 day moving average. And that's important because it does have an impact on the market. Um, there are a lot of technical traders out there that that buy or sell based on whether the price is above or below the 200 day moving average. So the fact that we've now gone above it we spent a day retesting it and then took off again to finish the week is certainly a net positive. Just keep that chart in mind, the way that the, the uh, moving averages are aligned and where the price is. The price is above all three of the moving averages, short, medium and long term. Now we'll look at the NASDAQ via the QQQ, which is the ETF that covers the NASDAQ. And you'll see that we've we're still below the 200 day. We've managed to get back above the shorter term moving averages, but quite clearly the more aggressive part of the US market and, and what you need for a robust overall advance is you need the money flows to be supporting the aggressive parts of the market. You don't want the leaders to be defensive stocks. You know, that is not a sustainable uh, bull market. So to get really comfortable with the market again, we, we need to see leadership back in the aggressive sectors and we're not quite there yet. Now, if we take a look at some of the, um, the important spread charts. All right, so we'll start first of all, this is um, <clears throat> US small cap growth versus small cap value. We had a little consolidation, but you can see we've been unable to break to new short term highs and it looks like we might be rolling over and heading down again. So certainly small cap growth is not yet getting the support that you really need to see for um, for a healthy bull market advance. Now this is the Nasdaq versus the S&P. We've certainly rebounded relatively and the S&P has gone up. So the NASDAQ, this is the fact that this ratio is rising means that the NASDAQ has gone up by even more than the S&P. So in the very short term, looking much better, but it's, but it's way below uh, where it was in, um, at the start of 2021 and also towards the end of 2021. This is consumer discretionary. This is really important, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. Again, we've got a nice short term rebound, but look at the bigger picture. This is a very steep downtrend and we're yet to set new highs on the ratio. So that's still a bit a bit mixed. This is in very steep downtrend. Yes, the short term has been great. 
but we really need to get above this 2.5 uh, ratio to feel comfortable about where the market's going. This is um, Russell 1000 growth versus value. Again, it's the same story. Medium term, we've had a very uh, steep downdraft, money rotating into value stocks or out of growth stocks, but we've had a really nice rebound. Did pull back a bit on Friday, as you can see. Um, so that one is showing promise, but it's not quite there yet. Okay, let's also have a look at the US dollar. So we're still in an overall quite strong uptrend. We've been getting consolidation now for the last couple of weeks. But if we pan back, we had an all-time, uh, not an all-time high, but certainly a, um, a multi-year high in March of 2020 of the, of the uh, US dollar. That was at about 103. We're sitting at just under 99 at the moment, but it's certainly tracking in the right direction. The Australian dollar has had a, a tremendous couple of weeks with the strength in commodities, and we finished at um, at 74 and a half on the Aussie dollar. So we're right back up to the the top of this range. So things looking pretty positive there. Uh, the other thing I just want to take a look at is so this is the um, the U.S. 10-year Treasury. So we put this first of all look on a six month basis and you can see we were flat around the 1.5 percent mark for some time and then uh, basically at the start of this year we took off and we've gone from 1.5 to 2.5 so it's been um, a very very sharp you know that that move that's a 75 80 percent move in three months you don't see that too often in um, in the treasury market so that's a really really strong indicator if we look at the 10-year, two-year spread, we're down at 0.18. We've come down from around about 1.5 at um, a year ago. Uh, we haven't inverted yet and may not do because a couple of years back we had a similar situation and I think it inverted for maybe a, a few days or a week and then it just went straight back up again. So there's no guarantee that this is going to um, cause any issues. And the VIX... We're now back down to the, the levels around 20 that, uh, that we've spent most of the last uh, couple of years at. All right, moving now to the Australian market, um, 74.5, as I said, on, on our dollar. Um, the ASX 200 index was up 1.5% across the week. Um, but look, it's mostly thanks to resources. There was strength in, in all areas. Um, but energy and materials in particular um, led the way. And we've seen the continuation of some really excellent moves in resource stocks, small and mid cap, and it just offers a great deal of opportunity in Australia. But as I mentioned uh, at the start, there are also some non-mining stocks, um, industrial, even some consumer stocks. They're not necessarily buyers at the moment, but they certainly are wonderful businesses. And if you can get a good entry into them, then um, you know I think they're going to provide a very good long-term return. And I'm going to be highlighting that in Portfolio Analyst this week. Turning now to precious metals, uh, gold was up by $40, so quite a good week for gold, 1958. Uh, last week, I said that the key support level needed to hold. Well, it did. And so that's at least one tick for gold. Precious metals, looking at uh, GDXJ, is continuing to outperform in the short term. And, and that's, a, that's a positive. And it's starting to emerge as a bit more of a positive now. Stocks in the gold market tend to, the miners tend to do better. They tend to lead the gold price. That hasn't been happening for a long period of time. So if this can continue just a little bit longer, it might um, it might just be pointing to a better period for, for the gold market. So let's take a look at the ASX 200 first. So you can see where the, the highs in that market were around 7,600 points. We closed at 7,400 points. So we're only about 200 points down from the, the all-time highs. 
There's materials, did extremely well, and you can see some significant volumes moving into materials as well. Uh, but also energy was, um, was another uh, area of strength for our market. Now, if we look at um, the gold price, this is on a weekly basis. This was the support level it needed to hold around about the 1910, 1915 mark, uh, and it did. And so in the short to medium term, we certainly do have an uptrend. So this uptrend started in, uh, in February, so it's been running now for about six, six seven weeks. So some more promising signs for, uh, for gold. Silver also starting to move um, a little bit as well. So that's the precious metals market. Turning now to, um, to other commodities, um, copper edged ahead a little bit, $4.67. Nickel just been absolutely all over the place. There are, um, there are curbing limits in, um, in place in the London Metals Exchange because the price volatility is just so extreme. It got down, I think, to 13, which is um, which is where where it was prior to the Russian invasion. Uh, shot up to 22 when there was a massive uh, short squeeze going on, um, and has finished the week at 16, uh, 11. You can't say the nickel market is remotely back to normal at this stage, so still pretty unpredictable. Uh, crude oil uh, up again to 113 and the long-term price outlook is extremely bullish for uh, for oil now and I'll, I'll touch on that uh, to a greater extent on the next slide there's been roughly three to four million barrels a day <clears throat> which would normally be exported from Russia is now effectively out of the market at least uh, directly so that is putting pressure on a market that was already pretty tight in terms of supply and demand. Um, the US has, really, has been unable to raise output, and in fact their, um, their output is less than it was um, uh, back in 2020. So when you put all that together, it's not ridiculous to say we could see oil at $200 a barrel, and I'll put some more substance to that on the next slide. And part of the reason is is just the commerciality of, the, you know, many U.S. fracking companies just they don't trust the long term environment to to invest. You know, investment in oil is a massive amount of money that requires a long term uh, payoff to make it viable. And I don't think anyone feels confident enough in the the long term. Um, demand situation for oil and gas to actually invest the vast amounts of money needed to um, you know to go out and, and explore. US production as I said earlier is is less than it was in 2020 despite the fact of all these high prices. Normally high commodity prices are a huge incentive for um, you know for companies to um, to ramp up their production. It's just not happening this time, and there's some there's some understandable reasons why that is. So, in my view, looking at all the factors, and I'm talking over the next um, you know one year through to five years, is that supply is unlikely to catch up to demand unless prices go really high above two hundred dollars a barrel, which you then get demand destruction. In other words, it's just so expensive that the, the demand side just starts to fall off. People just can't afford it anymore. So that's likely to be the, uh, the solution um, to, uh, to the, um, the supply situation, that demand just drops off. And if you look at it from the company's um, investing perspectives, it's just so easy for the oil and gas companies around the world now to make a huge amount of money. So why would they invest a lot? The, at these sort of prices, their margins are through the roof. The reality is, particularly in America, there's a shortage of labor. There's a shortage of materials that are required in, uh, in the production. Um, there is this whole issue of um, environmental, social and governance activism, which is really putting huge pressure on the boards of these oil and gas companies to, um, you know, to pull back, not to invest. Uh, more and if you have that sort of pressure on you, 
at a time when you're making money hand over fist, then you can see it's easy just to sit back and not do what you would normally do to ramp up production. There's also been um, shareholder activism for big dividends from the oil companies. You know, for so long, oil companies didn't pay out very much of their profits. They reinvested it in exploration, very expensive exploration. But as a result of a lot of shareholder thumping of the table, um, dividends in US oil and gas stocks are up 180% since 2018. So shareholders are happy. They don't want the companies to go out and invest massive amounts of money. Um, the boards are happy. Um, they're making lots of money. Management's making lots of money with bonuses. You know, so all those vested interests are being looked after. So you've got to ask yourself, why would the companies go out and invest massive amounts of money into a, into a long-term market that is questionable because of um, the concern about fossil fuels? So the solution really is that there should be even more massive efforts into the renewable sector because there doesn't appear to be another solution. If you don't like fossil fuels and you don't like high prices of fossil fuels that come as a result of that, then you've just got to ramp up renewables even more quickly than what they have been attempting to do. And that has to be a huge benefit for Aussie miners. So that's where my logic goes in this whole process. So... I think that's just put another level of confidence around what Australian nickel, lithium, copper, graphite stocks are, uh, are doing, uh, mineral sands, um, fertilisers. So, you know, there really is some very fertile um, hunting grounds in that, uh, that area. There's the spot copper chart edged up during the week, uh, but there's the nickel chart. It's just been all over the place. Quite, quite an extraordinary period. And I've zeroed in on the last little bit. So I've zeroed in on this, this part here. So just a 30-day spot chart so you could get a better sense of uh, just the extreme volatility that we've had since, um, since the start of the war. All right, wrapping it up. Um, we're in an investment world that really requires more clarity than you've ever had about your investing efforts before. You know, the idea of buying indices, just doing the general run-of-the-mill diversification, is just not going to cut it anymore. And in fact, I think it's just going to be rather dangerous. We're seeing an incredible diversification across the markets. There are stocks that are doing very well. There are stocks that are doing really, really badly. And I just can't see anything that's going to change that, that divergence. So it really requires a great deal of clarity about the sort of stocks that you that you should own, stocks that are suitable for you, um, and then the patience to wait for them and, and not experience fear of missing out and want to just you know chase prices. Uh, there are numerous very strong businesses, highly probable growth stocks, um, which are cheap. Now I'm talking predominantly in Australia here. There are some in America. But certainly the American market as a whole is more expensive than the Australian market. Um, but there are, there are quite a number of Australian uh, small and mid-cap growth stocks, which um, I, I don't know whether they're necessarily a, the best entry price at the moment. And I can't tell you when the price might start to move because some of them are, are not in favour. But looking two years out... Um, you know, if, if there's anything fair about investing, then these stocks should do extremely well. You need to identify them, so be very clear on what they are. Build a plan around them. Stay focused on what you're doing. Don't get distracted by the media. Don't get distracted by the voices in your head. Um, and just execute confidently. And, um, you know, that's, that's sort of the focus of both Portfolio Analyst and the Insiders Club. Portfolio Analyst last week, we looked at was it time to move back into the market? So that was Wednesday last week. And, you know, I'd had my two days grace to, to look at the US market. And, um, you know, it was, was obvious that we could start moving back in and start judiciously buying some stocks. So we re ended up reviewing uh, quite a number of high conviction opportunities and, uh, and targets. So I think it was, uh, was another pretty good session. There is a trial, of course, for $1 for two weeks. 
if you haven't tried Portfolio Analyst. There's more information on the website. There's my email address and um, I will be back with you next Sunday. Cheers.